Hi, am I talking into the mic? Okay, good. So uh, I'm actually not going to talk about rapid electric vehicles, my, my company, too much because uh, I can't talk about it without pitching. So <laughs> I'm going to give you guys the backstory on how this whole thing came to be in, in a, a blindingly short time. Uh, my name is Jay Jero. I'm the founder and CEO of Rapid Electric Vehicles. Uh, and for the past year, uh, a lot of really surprising things have happened in my life. Uh, first of all, I founded a company called Rapid Electric Vehicles, or REV. And uh, that happened in, I don't know, just over a year now. Uh, and uh, I had a kid. And uh, yeah, that came about the exact same time, so it was kind of burning the whatever at both ends. Um, but before all of that, you know, I also settled down, got a house and a family and everything, and it's all been really exciting. But uh, before all of that, I used to be a professional snowboarder. And, and this is what I did for a living for, for many years. And it was a great time. Uh, travel the world out of three bags that could fit everything I owned, which was just, I thought it was the coolest thing. I always prided myself on that. Uh, bounced around in and out of airports and ski resorts all over the place. Uh, after about five years of that, though, I started to uh, sustain a lot of injuries. I don't have any pictures of the injuries, sorry. thought that might be a little bit too gory. I, actually, I do. I have x-rays somewhere. Um, and, and that was all well and good. But, you know, after a lot, a lot of years of doing this, it kind of takes its toll on your body. Um, and this was about 2002 when the war in Iraq had just kicked into place and global warming itself was starting to be accepted as a really real phenomenon, kind of agreed upon by a lot of scientists and politicians uh, around the world. It wasn't being argued so much anymore. And uh, in Whistler, where we were based, uh, me and everybody else that was snowboarding for fun, uh, were honestly starting to wonder about how much snow was going to be on the hills in 10 years. And even IntraWest had a contingency plan for if there would be no snow for the Olympics. And everyone was really worried about it. Uh, I think there were some big hurricanes around that time too, so it all seemed so real, you know. And with injuries and not much of a, of a, of a snowboarding future to uh, look forward to anymore, I started to wonder where I was going to fit into all of this stuff. And, you know, all of the issues and challenges we were facing in the world, uh, you know, everything from famine to whatever, global warming and things like that, I thought, how could I do something that would give me a future that I would want to put the rest of my life into? Uh, and and besides, who am I to just wake up one morning and, and just think I can solve some problems? I mean, I don't have a big degree. I'm not a physicist who's going to figure out how to stop storms or anything like that. And I think these are just a lot of things that a lot of people face. Like, we all want to do something, but we don't know where to start. And so, you know, we either just try to do it and it doesn't go anywhere, or we try to ignore all the stuff we read in the paper. Like, I don't even read the paper anymore because it's, it's so much of that stuff. So I actually at the time also realized that there can be no integrity for me in my life if all is well and good for me and all of these things are happening around the world. And I declared as a purpose in my life that I would do everything I could to transform society and into a more sustainable one as quickly as possible. And I told all my family and friends, and they said, that's really great, we're all behind you. And then they expected all this out of me and I got really scared and went into hiding for about a year and a half and pretended I never said anything at all. And, and uh, you know, like I said, where am I going to get up one morning and just start fixing things? But I was learning at the time, just seeing a lot of things, seeds planting and in, in, in things I was watching and learning and talking to people about, that the problems in the world or the challenges we face, they're not really external. Everything external is a symptom or a, a reaction from a cause. And that really all these challenges we face are internal. They're the decisions we make every day, the things we choose to look at and deal with and the things we choose to ignore. They're all the little micro decisions we make all along the day. And uh, I started to see that, at least I believe, that our relationship to energy is the number one problem and solution to all of the challenges we're facing in society here in North America. And I'm not really looking globally here, just as our society. And, and you know, like the consumption of energy and the uses of energy and the production of energy in all its forms and, and how we relate to that like, I know exactly how many gallons of gas goes into my car every day, but I can't, for the life of me, tell you how many kilojoules that is. I do know it's about enough energy converted to electricity to run your house for a month. So just to put it into perspective. And so that's all well and good, but so esoteric. Like, so what? Our relationship to energy. What do I do with that, right? And I was talking to a marketing guru one day, and she said to me that uh, people don't alter people's behavior. And that's what I wanted to do, was alter our relationship to energy. Technology alters people's behavior. And I thought about that. It hit me like a ton of bricks. Like, look at the cell phone and look at the internet and computers and all this stuff, right? Look at how text messaging has altered the way we relate to communication individually and as a whole. It's totally altered our behavior, right? I can see people doing it right now. <laughs> so, 
with that, I thought, what's the one elect, like, te technology device that we use pervasively in society that consumes a ton of energy everywhere? And I realized it's the car, right? The car, everybody has a car. There's 900 million cars in the world. Uh, I can't visualize 900 million anything. It's, it's so hard to relate to that. And I remember my grade 11 auto mechanics teacher said that uh, a car is at best 25% energy efficient. The rest of it goes to friction and heat. So I'm putting $80 of gasoline in my car. I'm getting 20 of it to move me around in the day, push around 4,000 pounds of steel. And all of that goes up in the atmosphere and, and the other $60 of my money goes to friction and heat. I'm buying friction and heat. I'm paying for that in the world. Like that's, just because 900 million people do it doesn't make it not crazy. You know, if we really look at it, it's pretty crazy. So I started to research alternative energy pretty voraciously from, uh, I don't know, 04 on to 07, and uh, learned about hydrogen and biodiesel and ethanol and electricity and E85, and really wanted to figure what could make the biggest difference in the shortest amount of time. And uh, I came down to that it was really going to be electricity. But there's no silver bullet, by the way. We're going to need all of these energy choices for the next 100 years. And so one day I'm riding my motorbike on the uh, Sea to Sky Highway. This is the Tantalus Glaciers, and it was just so beautiful. It looked probably better than this. And for some reason, I flicked off the motorbike and just coasted in neutral at about 60 miles an hour. And instantly, I could hear birds flying over my head. I could smell the creek I was riding by. It was dead silent. And I realized, this must be what it's like to drive an electric car. It was spectacular. And I want you guys all to experience it. It's like nothing else. So that's what I decided to get behind. And I uh, wrote a business plan for two years. And I'm talking to a lot of investors and stuff, uh, this was 07. And in very late 07, December 14th, 2007, I'm talking to an investor in New York that we had a lot of talks with. And at some point he said, you know, we've talked a lot. And people can smell commitment from a mile away. So that was the last time I ever heard from him. I could never get a hold of him again, but that really landed for me. And the next day, I went into work. I was working at an auto dealership. Had a girlfriend that had just gotten pregnant, didn't have any money in the bank, didn't know how I was going to pay rent at the end of the month, let alone buy Christmas gifts. And I was shaking. I was so scared. I quit my job right on the spot. Walked into the general manager's office, told him I had to start an electric car company. And he must have thought I was crazy, and I sure did. But one thing I did do is I promised to myself that we would put electric cars on the road in 2008. And, uh, and we did. So... Uh, we developed a technology that transforms fleet vehicles into 100% electric. So it's like this giant reuse it program. There's 300 million cars in North America. 63 million of those are government and passenger commercial fleet vehicles. So I saw this as an opportunity to help government fleets lead by example, drive down their emissions, meet their carbon neutral mandates, save a lot of money because they own these things for 12 to 15 years, and start to solve the problem and bring the technology to the consumer as quickly as possible. So that's what we're about. And uh, I'm really excited about the future. I just, sure, there's lots of challenges in the world, but it seems like everybody is involved in helping to make a difference for the future. So I'm really excited about it, and I look forward to seeing you all there. Thank you very much for your time. Actually, we have two minutes for questions. Can we take some questions? And I, I want to thank my friend from up north for converting two miles per hour for us. That's great. Um, so, about 90 seconds, one or two questions for Jay. A, a quick odd question. Sure. How do you uh, suddenly make your car noisy for a bicyclist or a That's a good question. Actually, um, ours is kind of noisy. If the AC drive motor, it makes more noise than people think, but they're very, very quiet at low speeds. And that's the problem, like Priuses and everything are so quiet at low speeds. Uh, everyone's working on little devices that will actually, you'll be able to choose the sound, like a ringtone. So you can make a big roar or a horse hooves, which is the most popular ringtone for Priuses in Japan. So there's going to be solutions for sure. I guess there are no further questions. Jay, thank you very, very much.